What I want to talk about is give you an overview, give you an idea of what the Rice Project is, and also why this center is involved in it, uh, which is very unusual. This is the first time in a, a Welsh European funding office, or a probably uh, uh, EU-funded program, which is very engaged in solving a problem, has actually uh, incorporated storytelling into that process of solving the problem. So the RICE project is, uh, RICE stands for Reducing Industrial Carbon Emissions. And our goal is very simple. We need to demonstrate technology. We need to demonstrate that we could make a difference. But at the same time, we've got to create value locally, regionally. We've got to create um, a culture in the region that accepts the change but embraces it because it could enhance the region. So before I start, let's think about the challenge. Now Wales is a little different than the rest of the UK. If you consider carbon emissions from the UK, the major source in the UK is power production, energy production. Here in Wales, that's not true. In Wales, it's industry, it's heavy industry. 40% of CO2 emissions in Wales comes from industry. Half of that comes from one location, Tata Steel. Tata Steel is the largest CO2 emitter point source in the United Kingdom. It's one of the largest in Europe. Right? So if you need to create an impact, if you need to create uh, a change, this is an area. Changing one car at a time, changing one house at a time, is, very, is, is a step in the right direction, but it's not going to be a game changer. So well, one of the problems is uh, Port Talbot's facility, um, you know, you could close it, that would solve the problem, but uh, you know, it's worth 1.2 billion a year to the economy of South Wales. It's worth uh, 200 million in wages alone. It employs uh, somewhere around 5,000 people directly, and 6,000 indirectly. If Port Talbot closed, it would be a disaster for South Wales. Disaster for communities, disaster for uh, the country as a whole. So, we've got to find an alternative. And one of the, my goals in starting this project, there are a number of different academic projects looking at reducing emissions, re looking at alternative energies. There's ones in Europe. There's a major program in the Netherlands. However, it's a study. And so one of the things that I realized, it's too late to study this anymore. Someone has to take the bull by the reins and go and actually solve the problem. Demonstrate that it works. Demonstrate that you can do it. Demonstrate that it's economically viable. Demonstrate that it makes a difference. So this project is unlike academic projects all over the UK. Uh, I was recently at a, a RC UK, Research Council UK meeting where they're talking about this new strategy the UK government's gonna do, and they announced, oh, we need to do this, and they announced sort of the scope. And I said, hmm, that's nice, we're in year two. We're already there, all right? So part of it is, how do we actually make that difference? So the solutions are a number. We could stop emissions, right? So we could close the industry. In fact, I even went to Welsh Assembly and said, if you give me the power, I will tomorrow to remove 20% of CO2 emissions and methane emissions in Wales. And they were like, well, that's nice. And I said, fine, we closed Tata Steel. You can understand the reaction. So we could do that. We can find alternative ways of reducing the emissions. And that could be, we use alternative fuels. In the area of transportation, we're talking about EVs and hydrogen. Well, industry, for a lot of its processes, creates heat. Everything's about generating either electricity or heat. There are some other processes, but electricity and heat, industry, in theory, could switch to alternative fuels. However, in a lot of industries, they inherently make CO2 as part of the process. Steel, glass, cement, all of them generate CO2 no matter what they did. Even if they use wind power 
to, do, to create electricity, to create heat, they would still generate CO2. So you've got to come up with other approaches. You can replace emissions in some cases, but in others you can't. <laughs> Third approach, sequestration. We can put it somewhere. And, and within uh, my institute at Swansea University, we have a major program to do that. But in this case, that may not be the solution because all you're doing is taking that CO2, and yes, you capture it, you sequester it, it's safe, it's somewhere that's not going to affect the climate, but you're not adding value. You're not changing the community. So the fourth one is you can use it. You can take that CO2, turn it into something else. Now we get to the issue. You could either think of Tata Steel and Port Talbot as the largest single CO2 emitter in the UK, or you could think of them as the largest resource of carbon, which makes up so many things that we have around us. Right? The chairs you're sitting on could be made from CO2. Many of the clothes you wear are now made from petroleum. They could be made from CO2. So we can utilize that CO2. So that's part of our goals. So what the RICE project does is it aims to do two and three. We're going to develop approaches which reduce the amount of CO2 emitted, and at the same time we're going to capture that CO2, and we're going to use it to create something of high value and create new industry, create new infrastructure in the region. So where are we going to put this? I said this is all about actually doing something. It's not about talking about it. It's not about sitting in an academic laboratory. It's about going out and making a difference. So this is a Google map of part of Port Talbot. The long skinny building is what's called the Capital Line. It's the continuous annealing and processing line. What it basically does is takes pretty decent steel and turns it into the steel that's used to make your automobiles. It's used to make uh, high-end uh, construction material. Right? It's what is the value of proposition of Tata Steel's uh, uh, system. What we've got is we've got an area next to that, which is going to become the rice demonstration site. Uh, it should be available for tours or visits in September. It should be open. We're in the middle of constructing all the units, that are, or some of the units that are going on there. Uh, our partners at University of South Wales have another site that's at the other end. We're finalizing where that's going to go. But the goal is actually to put this technology onto site use the real emissions, monitor that, and evaluate how much we're reducing, how much we're creating value, and how much we're uh, changing the way in which industry operates. So what are we actually going to do? And this I call my Battle of Hastings model, right? Arrows flying everywhere. So if on the left you've got Tatar steel, that's their line. In that process, they use natural gas and air to generate heat. They have a burner, and that heats the steel. They then pass hydrogen over the, the steel, and, uh, and that reduces the carbon that's in there, but they create, obviously, carbon dioxide. So they've got a hot flue gas. We're going to take that flue gas. It's at several hundred degrees centigrade. We're going to take the heat out of that and generate electricity. The heat will now come to a, big, a cold flue gas. That will go into what's called a pressure absorption system, uh, which basically takes the uh, CO2 out of that gas, and we can eliminate the nitrogen and water vapor. That can go in the atmosphere. Now we've got a very rich CO2. That rich CO2, Enrico is going to talk a little bit about the separation, and that's going to go into an electrocatalysis system that generates high-value chemicals. Chemicals that are used, everything from the pharmaceutical, aerospace industries, polymers and so on. Alternatively, we're going to take that CO2 rich gas and put it into an algae uh, biorefinery and happens to be next to Tata Steel as Welsh Water. It's a sewage treatment plant. We're going to take their raw, well it's actually their treated sewage, which is high in nitrates and phosphates. We're going to take that and mix it with the CO2, use an algae biorefinery. It will be the largest one in Europe ever built. And from that, the, the initial product would be pure protein. Why pure protein? It can be used for animal feed. It can be used for human consumption. We're working with a company called Volac. 
Volac, you probably don't know, but corn, you do. Volac is the supplier of protein to corn. So we're working on getting a certification for human consumption. So the idea here is we're going to be feeding people. We're going to be either feeding uh, fish and, and uh, dairy farms, or we're going to be feeding uh, humans. However, if you extract out of that algae, depending on which algae you use, you can get some very high value chemicals, which at least 50% of you have probably got on you right now. One of them is an omega-3 lipid. It's one of the most common antioxidants used in makeups, uh, hand creams, uh, medical applications. Uh, it's used in, as a food additive, a food stabilizer. And predominantly, it comes from petroleum. This is a way to get it from algae, from a natural source. So, in one stream, we're taking heat out of the flue gas. We take the CO2 out, we use that. Why do we want to generate electricity? Well, it turns out we can either use that for electrolysis, we can actually use it for the algae reactor. Uh, algae needs sunlight. Now, it turns out that algae gets sunburn, just in the same way as you and I can go out in the sun too often, or too long, we get sunburn. Algae go, have to go the same process when certain light frequency hits them. They start overproducing certain chemicals. And those chemicals have value. Some of them are dyes. The blue dye that a lot of people have in clothing is actually made from algae. It's very high value. So what we're doing is we're actually using sunlight. We're also using LED lights of certain frequencies. So we're going to be producing the algae 24 hours a day. And we're getting the electricity for free. It comes from heat. We're, we're not combusting anything to get it. On the other hand, we can take that electricity and through a process that's called zero gap electrolysis, we take rainwater, which here in South Wales, we have plenty of, right? <laughs> and there happens to be a really large building that we're next to on Tatar's facility, and we're actually going to be connecting to their guttering system, collecting that rainwater, converting it with that free electricity to hydrogen and oxygen. Now, hydrogen is actually one of the chemicals that Tatar use in their line, and we can replace natural gas with hydrogen. We can use the oxygen, because also that's a, uh, they use air, but if they use oxygen as the uh, combustant, as the oxidant, it's more efficient. So again, they would lower their CO2. So this gives you an idea of some of the components but the complexity, this isn't one project, it's not one technology. The idea is to create an infrastructure, much like uh, the oil industry does in terms of, you know, you think you get a barrel of oil and it all goes into the tank in your car. No, it gets separated. Its infrastructure is completely integrated to about a thousand companies by the time that barrel of oil gets used up. We need to think about waste heat carbon dioxide in the same way. We're not just making one product. We're going to make multiple processes to generate employment, generate a new culture of taking that CO2 and using it. So why do I think this is important? Well, it comes back to another Rice. I'm also a professor at Rice University in the States. Um, and back in 62, 61, 62, uh, JFK gave a speech at the football stadium. And at that speech, he announced that by the end of the decade, the U.S. would put a man on the moon. And that in science and in change in science and engineering is clearly a watershed moment. Because the increase in development of technology to solve that one problem, and you can argue about whether it was a great problem to solve or not, but the increase in technology to solve that problem was fantastic. The number of scientists, the number of engineers, the advances in computing. So if you think about the environment, you could paraphrase his part of the speech, and it comes back to Joseph's uh, initial comments, that instead of saying we choose to go to the moon in this decade, I think we need to say we choose to save the planet in this decade, right? And do the other things, not because they're easy, because they clearly aren't, but because they're hard, because the goals that will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because the challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one which we are unwilling to postpone, 
and which we intend to win. And I think that sums up where scientists and engineers need to concentrate. This is probably the biggest technical challenge that humanity will face. But it's something that we can't wait. We have to actually engage and do it. So with that, let me give you there's some links. If anyone wants to, please follow us on, on, on Twitter. We try and keep everyone updated with progress. <coughs> And, uh, and I'm sure Joseph will uh, give the slides if people want to be able to download them or see them later on. And uh, I'll turn it over to which of the two of you? You go next time. <laughs> the, the next part of the uh, sequence is for you to hear from the various work package leaders. There are eight, and then there's the additional work package that's the storytelling work package. And we'll talk about that at the end. But uh, Richard Dimsdale will. aspects that we're doing on our work packages at the University of South Wales in the, uh, in the Rice Project. Apologies, it is a bit deaf by PowerPoint, but uh, we might learn something about a good narrative. <laughs> Turbines said, 
Ooh, don't like to fancy that. It'll spoil the view. We spoil the view of the steelworks. <laughs> uh, <you know. laughs> crazy, crazy. So, uh, so we have a remote link to the uh, wind turbines. And you can see actually wind turbines are spreading along the coast and uh, along into the mountains there. So uh, public perception does change. Uh, and we uh, are refueling vehicles. So we have a really simple Rasa sports car here, and then we have the fire uh, uh, service car there. We don't want to be long-term fuel, refueling attendant for too long, so we're hoping the hydro will take off wider so we can uh, pass on a baton to Shell or somebody else to uh, do the refueling. But there's a global vision for hydrogen. It's not just us. Uh, Arthur and Pell, large chemical company have a vision of using hydrogen in their chemical supply. Numerous books written about the hydrogen economy and the refueling station, I think that on the left that's on Honda, I think the one there is in Korea. Swindon. Swindon, yeah. Swindon. yeah. So it's not just us, not just the University of South Wales. So, the other aspect, which is more closely uh, to my sort of heart, is that we're looking at reducing the carbon issues from steel. So, steel in, in a way it's a wonderful material, it's a critical component of a modern industrial society, it's recyclable and it breaks down to rust, so, you know, not, it does can potentially last a long time, but uh, it is not persistent like plastics. But it's highly energy intensive and carbon intensive. And the, the gases I'm looking at treating, well actually I'm not looking at treating them, I'm going to force Pat TV to eat these gases and produce products. <coughs> so we've got coke oven gas, uh, BF, BFG, it's not a big friendly giant, that's blast furnace gas. Uh, Foss gas is basically oxygen uh, system gas. So, uh, you can see the CO and CO2 is a green and a red, and their major components are particularly of BFG and Bosch gas. And you look at the volumes of blast furnace gas, that's 500,000 normal meters per hour. Let's use that. This room is only 800 cubic meters, so 500 times an hour going through this room. So, I'm a lazy scientist, I don't do anything. Um, all I have to do is keep my bacteria happy. And uh, the bacteria I'll be using are uh, actually, I harvest them from the local sewage treatment work. Go along the sewage treatment works, collect them, put them in a reactor, feed them those gases, and actually produce useful products for us. We produce ethanol and then acetic acid. I'm more keen on acetic acid because that's a basic chemical feedstock and also it traps more CO2. Uh, and, and so I've, I've directed my bacteria to produce acetic acid. Hopefully we'll do what they're told. <laughs> so, <clears throat> why I'm interested in bacteria, they work at low temperatures and pressures. So we don't have to have sophisticated vessels or reactors or put lots of energy in. They're resistant contaminant gases. The bacteria you, I use have been around for 3 billion years. They won't survive 3 billion years if they were a bit delicate. They are not the pandas of, like, <laughs> of, the, of the world. They, they're tough and resistant and so I'm going to use them to do that. Also, a self-sustaining regenerating catalyst. They're free. You don't have to pay anybody huge amounts of cash to use them. They're extreme, uh, uh, good abilities to complete complex molecules in one step from simple compounds. That's 
really, it's not really simple. They have complicated metabolic processes to do that. But uh, they can do that in a nice little package, nanometers in size, grows, lives, and you don't have to pay any money. Uh, and we can manipulate those pathways to produce alternative products. And they're natural. So, how are we going to use this? So, we're going to feed in our gases. My bacteria will produce the acetate. I'm going to extract them. So, I'm going to create a gap between my nasty industrial gases and then I feed the acetate to other well known bacteria or yeast species to produce uh, lipids. SCP is single cell protein, or PHA is a bioplastic. We tend to concentrate a little bit on energy, but actually we're dependent on chemicals. 10% of hydrocarbons are used in chemicals. So if we can take out fossil fuels from that area, we can have a much more sustainable economy. And as Andy said, we'll probably, we need to achieve significant carbon reductions, 80% by 2050. Well, actually, probably 2050 is too late, really. It's probably more like 2030. And to do that is incredibly hard uh, because there's a hardcore fixed carbon, either in agriculture, steel making, cement making, that'd be difficult to ship. So, you know, we have to be very smart to meet those targets. <coughs> so, I've got my work, I've got my battery work in the laboratory. Tata engineers have designed a, a relatively small bioreactor. It's only about 150 litres. Biker can produce, depending on how well it works, either 7 kilos a week or 7 kilos a day of product. And that's sufficient to show that it's working. When you're dealing with steel people, that industry is 200 years old. Any change, they have to make sure it works, and then the scale of it is huge. I mean, in a way, a steel works is an awful blight on the, work, on, on the world, but if you walk around it, it's an amazing engineering and chemical feat. You see raw materials brought in, huge amount of energy, and product come out of the end. It's, a, it's an amazing sight. So we're going to deploy this, test it out, uh, hopefully by May or June. So, thank you for your attention, and hopefully I've been too deaf by now. <laughs> just this conversation. Uh, I'm going to cover similar aspects of this uh, project that has been already covered by Professor Barr and then uh, later. Uh, and focusing on work package one. So RICE has, uh, it's made of different work packages. The first one is uh, capturing CO2 and uh, getting the CO2 ready to be used later as you just heard. So the aim of the first work package is to work with the industry, and that's a key part of it. We want to work with them to make this for real with a, a demonstrator. So we, can, we want to demonstrate that we can uh, uh, reduce CO2 emissions and make a good use of CO2. So in a general term, you can look at this as uh, you have an industrial process available, it can be any industrial process, which is different than uh, burning uh, fossil fuels. So usually when you hear about uh, capturing CO2, it's because we burn fossil fuel and emit CO2. Industrial processes emit CO2 independently from burning fossil fuel. So you have uh, an industrial process producing a mixture of gases, 
So you have CO2 mixed with the other gases together. And then you need a technology, a technique, to be able to take out from this mixture CO2 itself to be then used. <coughs> now, in this slide I put uh, uh, pharmaceutical there. It's not that the machine and the technology we, we develop will actually spit out uh, drugs and uh, pharmaceuticals, but intermediates to make those. And uh, without those intermediates, you can't actually make the pharmaceuticals. So, what's the challenge? From a work package point of view, the challenge is that you have various mixtures. The mixtures, as the word says, is just a mixing up of everything. And the challenge is to have a technology that allows you to separate CO2 from all these gases and emissions. So the goal for work package one is to develop a machine that is called pressure swing absorption unit, PSA unit. So what is it? In a, in a very non-technical okay, way, you would see a metal container, right, full of pipes around it, um, lights, bulbs, or you know, uh, these things. And inside there is uh, a, a material called absorbent or adsorbent. It's a sponge. This sponge has a characteristic, like CO2. So when it sees CO2, it uh, attracts CO2 and binds it to it. And we, call it, uh, we talk about CO2 as uh, the heavy part of the gas mixture. So you have your flue gas coming from the industrial process, going in the container with the sponge inside. This is flowing. The sponge likes CO2, removes CO2, and you have a clean gas coming out. When the sponge is full, you need to remove the CO2. And what you do, you swing the pressure from high to low, <coughs> and you remove the CO2. So it sounds easy, but I can assure you, it's not. And uh, you need a lot of engineering for this. <laughs> and uh, in this case, we heard already before about uh, blast furnace gases. Uh, they are mainly made of uh, CO2, CO, and uh, nitrogen. And the goal of World Package 1 would be to build this uh, PSA unit, you, which you cannot see because it's in the container we will use to bring it to Tata Steel. Mm -hmm. The two combined together <coughs> will produce CO2 that goes into making added value products, uh, either using and uh, abusing bacteria or uh, through uh, algae. We want to make this unit uh, not just for blast furnace gases, but uh, for other industry, uh, heavy industry present in Wales. This is an example. So we will be working also with others. We are already in contact with them. These compositions don't want to say anything then. You can see uh, the gases are all different, so the technology has to be flexible enough to treat these gases. And to finish, uh, once we have the CO2, uh, we already heard about, uh, from, about it from Professor Barron. Uh, we either have to store it or to use it. Ideally, you would like to use it. Also because uh, I know now there is a strong movement against, against plastics because uh, we find them in water, we find them everywhere, okay? But plastic is still an essential material for the way we are used to live. And if used properly, it's a great material. And that's why we want to look at this in a circular way, where we capture the CO2 the way we told you, and uh, we utilize it, and then it's emitted again, and we can use CO2 as a vector for a circular economy. So, how do we do this in ESRI, the Energy Sector Research Institute? Uh, we are developing technologies in the center of the slide, which is uh, uh, based on electrochemistry, and we design uh, boxes, let's call them, if you look at them, where inside there are uh, electrodes, membranes, materials, all technology designed to take these tiny molecules, CO2, combine it with water and electricity to produce, at the end, a useful product. In this case, they are uh, commodity chemicals, sustainable commodity chemicals. So the idea is to have then a value chain where the CO2 is the uh, you know, main character, the protagonist of the story, where we use it, it's not anymore a problem, it's a resource. CO2 ended up underground in millions of years, but it was still CO2. It's a value. And, and <laughs> well, I want to <coughs> turn things over to our lead storyteller on the project, William Gold, uh, because this is where we get to the question.
question of where storytelling comes in to projects like this. And so for a brief overview, I was contacted, Emily and I were contacted very early on when I first came here by uh, the Rice Project because of the work that the center had done in the decade or so previous. Uh, the center had developed a reputation for excellence in uh, disseminating stories of all kinds of social and cultural initiatives from the, the, the great big consortium that went into the Stories of Change project, which you will hear about later this afternoon, I believe, uh, with David Llewellyn and uh, Hamish Fife and a whole bunch of people from universities all over the UK, to the uh, Cider and Perry uh, uh, ag Agriculture in Wales project, um, Welsh Women's Aid project, and we have a, a whole long roster of such initiatives. And the perception was that um, with a technical project like this, there, is, there are various levels of funding and levels of scale by which it can make its way into society. And there's this thing I heard about early on when we were having our first group meetings called the Valley of Death. The Valley of Death is the place where good projects go to die. After they've been, after products and processes have been developed in the laboratory, to scale them up to industry to where they actually have a significant effect across the economy and across the ecosystem takes a great deal of resource investment. <coughs> and uh, very often those very good projects die on the vine before they get to an industrial scale. Uh, what we wanted to do with this project was to tell the story in forms where legislators, uh, policy makers, think tanks could really get an understanding of what the stakes were, first of all, and what the solutions might be, which involved making ourselves science storytellers. Um, and so William has been working uh, intrepidly at that and doing a brilliant job, and I will turn things over to him to discuss the work we've done so far. <coughs> Hi, how are we doing? So before I start in earnest, I'd like to just ask you a question. Um, hands up if any of this that well, as well, colleagues have talked about was on your radar before that you were aware of it. Yeah, a couple of hands. Yeah, yeah, Emily, you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm hoping that you have the reaction which I first did when I came along to meet Andrew, which was, oh my God, huh? yeah, there's, there's hope. There are solutions and people are working on them. Um, it immediately, for me, switched the, the narrative of climate change from tailpipe issues, which is all of us, what we put through our cars and our daily use and our consumerist lifestyles, and to the wellhead, the producers. Switch that conversation and those solutions there, which, if you're like me, you try, you try, don't you, to, to your best, you recycle, but you kind of think at the back of your head, Am I making much of a difference? So it's really, really encouraging for me personally to hear these stories of like, yes, people are looking at the solutions to really tackle the point source emitters, the big sources of the problem, which makes me feel better about what I'm doing because I feel like we're all in it together. So without further ado, I've got two videos to show you with a bit of talking in between. Uh, the first video is a trailer I put together to just sort of uh, sum up the whole project. Um, so, I want to have a look at that. <laughs> You'll recognize some of the language in this trailer from uh, Andrew, who is the... Um, <laughs> You might call it the JFK one. We jurors are going on board in this community to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The idea that there are so many technical challenges to overcome, 
makes it an exciting time for science. Our overall goal is to reduce industrial carbon emissions. Balancing our way of life and protecting the planet, this is going to be the biggest challenge that we face humankind. Many of the things that we make are made from carbon. Uh, polymers, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, food products, uh, food additives, personal care products. In, in some shape or form, some component of them often comes from petroleum. But I think if we stop using petroleum and instead we focus on taking CO2 and converting it, one of the things we need to do is change the conversation. From carbon is bad to carbon is an opportunity. Rice is all about what I would call technology transfer. It is taking concepts and ideas that you know seem very good on the chalkboard or very good in small laboratory test use and then transforming that into, into a real viable industrial process. All the real elements that we need to make rice successful exist in a very, very short space in South Wales. We are surrounded by the industry um, that could genuinely make a difference. Reduction in the emission of carbon is key to having a, you know, a stable and uh, reasonable dying world. It has to really change. You know? we, we, we can't just carry on um, taking resources from the planet with no consequences. Being able to convert one of the biggest polluters into the biggest resource is the power of that rice model. The impact of rice will change the way of thinking and uh, saying this is possible and uh, let's extend it to our other areas. In a firm step in the ground that says well actually that doesn't have to happen. All the doom and gloom hear across the news about all the massive storms and big droughts and huge, you know, roads of activity which are deserts, you know, all this kind of doom and gloom. You know, rice is a, is, a, is, a, is a bold step forward to say, well, actually, we've got technology. We're humans, we're quite clever, actually. When we break it all down, we can fix these problems. You know, I, I like to think that as, a, as an engineer, as a scientist, hopefully we leave the world in a better place than the way in which we found it. And if we do that, fantastic. Cool, so that'll give you an idea of one of the types of approaches we're, we're taking. So that's just a sort of short video introduction so people get an overview of the idea of the project. You'll notice a few framing techniques there, um, techniques taken from editing of Hollywood movies. The soundtrack I've used is an arrangement of Come On Lan, which is obviously a well-known uh, Welsh track. So this project really helps to move the centre into a new area, which is science communication, uh, which is a burgeoning and, in my opinion, really important area. And I think storytellers have a, a really valid contribution to make. Um, as Andrew pointed out, this hasn't been done before. The embedding of a, of a storyteller, in this case me, in the project as it's going along, rather than bringing them along and doing the whole thing retrospectively. So it's potentially a chance for, for us to shape the story, as well as just telling it. Um, so we're using a lot of different methodologies, um, so documentary film, journalism, digital storytelling, filmmaking, um, they are, we're looking at some performance and some artist, uh, physical art installations as so we basically, as Joseph said in the introduction, we're looking at a variety of techniques whenever it really helps to get the message across because it's not a message we can mess about with. Um, to give you an example of some of the framing techniques that we're looking to use as the project goes along, so we're just coming up to a year, well, a year and post for me, slightly over a year for the, for the project. Um, there's been a lot of talk there about opportunity, uh, which I think is a really, really important um, aspect. So. Uh, there are psychology studies which say that people are more prone to looking at saving and bringing back things from the past rather than projecting forward and trying to save things from the future because they're not formed yet. South Wales at one point was the industrial centre of the world. 
um, a centre for innovation, a centre for exports. Now that was driven by the fossil fuel industry, by stuff we dug out of the ground. It's something we could get back. It's something that, that we have the scientists, we have the technology, we have the drive and the will and the funding in some cases to actually make this region a new centre for industry, a new centre for innovation, but this time doing it in a way that doesn't harm the planet. So that's just one example of the sort of framing and sort of narratives that we're looking at telling as the project goes along. Um, my personal view is that the reporting is a bit too doom -laden. I talked about tailpipe and wellhead, um, and I would like to personally switch a little bit more to hope. Blame and guilt is not going to get anyone sort of into action, really, and this is very much a problem that our kids are going to inherit, rather than less that we have to deal with. So I would like to uh, look at what's been done and the opportunities and help to tell that story, because I don't think it's a message that's getting out there enough at the moment. Um, having said that, as you can see, I am a little bit guilty of using some of the, the storytelling and narrative conventions, the, the polar bears, the ice caps. These are just there at the moment, at the beginning of the story, uh, to help get people in the right frame. So I'm trying to piggyback these media conventions and hopefully sort of steer away from those doom laden images to ones of, of hope and, and industry. Um, so, I have one more video to show you. Um, this is, oh, just before I do that, sort of the main threads so that you um, know what to expect from the videos as we go through the project. Um, our science communications, which is the public engagement, the public stake in this, in the writer project. Climate change, defying the wider problem, which, as I'm sure you will know, is a, is a bit of a hydra of a problem. There are many heads, so there are many heads to the solutions as well. Um, Decarbonising industry, so climate change is, um, it's probably a better analogy, but the one I'm going to use is, if climate change is, is the war, Decarbonising industry is our battle, the battle that we're fighting for the Rice Project. And the Rice Project itself, the tech involved, those are the weapons that we're going to use. So, what I have now for you in this video is extract from four stories that um, I've put together. Um, they are an instructional video on how a hydrogen fuel cell works, um, a research and work package project introduction from Dr. Darren Andrew Radcliffe, um, an interview with a civil servant working in BASE, which is the UK government department business, energy and industrial strategy. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> um, so, and a video asking, are we too late? Uh, the are we too late video does have a happy ending, it's just I don't have time to put it into this video. <laughs> so, um, it's a little disjointed in this format, but all of these videos will be available in a variety of places online, so I hope that you'll engage with them as they are released. So, without further ado, this is um, cut together to give you an idea of um, what we're working on at the moment. I'm Dr. Dan Colby Radcliffe. Uh, I'm an associate professor currently at Swansea University. Hello, I'm Stephen Carr. I'm a researcher at the University of South Wales and I research into various aspects of the hydrogen economy. My name is Philip Kern, I've done chemical engineering training. Uh, I've worked in the industry for a majority of my career but then moved to become a civil servant. I'm the work package tool leader in Rife, and to most people I don't mean very much. Uh, but what work package tool is all about is sequestering carbon dioxide and turning it into a useful product. And in our specific work package, we're going to be doing that via uh, a technology called algal processing, or algal production technologies. Here we have a, a, a demonstration kit of a renewable hydrogen energy storage system where um, we have our um, hydrogen being produced by solar power with a lamp representing the sun. That, that lamp um, shines on a PV panel which produces electricity. That electricity runs through an electrolyzer which splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. We store the hydrogen and oxygen so that at times when we can't produce power from the sun, so at night time when it's cloudy, we can then use that hydrogen and oxygen, run those through a fuel cell to produce electrical power. Bayes is looking at the industrial strategy, the, the benefits of doing things like cream growth, but also looking at how we can decarbonise our energy system or, and our 
of the system. In the last six years, we've been, you know, our carbon has been going down, and there's a report out today from um, Carbon Brief, and they're saying over the last six years we've cut, the government haven't put their analysis out for the last five, couldn't the government in the last five, last five years, we've managed to cut our carbon intensity. There, there are opportunities as long as people are willing to change. And I think that's going to be the main challenge. Of, we like the way we do things currently. Um, and we've got to be open to change.